right. So four four number which one? Fifteen. So let's see. If four of the test subjects are randomly selected without replacement, find the probability that the polygraph indicated they all lied. So the probability to pick four people. Number fifteen. Four four. Probably all lied. This is without. Okay, and this is referring back to that uh, chart they gave at the beginning of the, even before the beginning, the page with the thing from Meet the Parents there. Um, so what's the probability somebody lied? Just looking at that chart. This is page 137. If you look at that chart. What's probably somebody lied? If I pick somebody, what's probably that they lied? 50-50, man. I agree with your brother. It's all made of crap. No, we know better than that. About 50% chance of snow today. It's crazy. So it's probably somebody lied. Help me out. I don't know. That's a good number so far. All right, okay, good. 51 out of 98. Good. One quick thing about probabilities. If you ever get a probability bigger than one or bigger than 100%, don't leave it alone. Something is wrong. Don't just tell me, it's 128% chance, Mr. Waller. <laughs> the hell, that snow, is that like super snow? Blah. Um, so probably somebody lied would be 51 out of 98. So if I pick four people and I want them all to lie. My so let's see, I got my little hangman game. It's probably first person lies, but we just figured that out. Fifth one out of ninety-eight. Good. All right. Can't go wrong with that one. The number's already there. And then I pick another person. Now remember, I pick somebody and I throw them out the room. You liar. Pick somebody else. What's probably they lie? Fifty out of ninety-seven. All right. Cool. Fifty out of ninety-seven. Forty-nine out of ninety-six. Forty-eight out of ninety-five. Forty-eight out of ninety-five. Okay. And then you just go to top. Just multiply those out. Is that cool? So it's like the, the, the pick a king and then pick another th king that we did the other day. Uh, or from that worksheet. I can't remember the example now, but um, when we picked a, somebody who was an independent and then a Republican, but we did it without replacement. So we just did it for two people, but if you do it for four people, it's the same idea. It just keeps going and going and going. So what's wrong if I say, is everybody cool with that? I just throw it in the old calculator, let that do all the work, right? Okay. So it's like if I said to you, what's the probability I pick without replacement, I pick four kings from a deck of cards. If I, uh, uh, let, me say, let me say it like this. If I pick five cards from a deck of cards without replacement, Let's probably get all kings. Zero. Good. I heard the right answer up here. What would the first one be? The first card is a king. What's the probability of that? Four out of fifty-two. What's the next one? Probably it's a king. It's going to be three out of fifty-one. Three out of fifty-one because there's one less king, one less card, one less king, one less card, one less king. Good God, Jeff. And the last dude, of course, the fifth card. How many kings are left? Zero. So the whole thing goes to zero. Yeah, good. Court. Can't pick five kings from a deck of cards without replacement. Now, with replacement, it's completely possible. Very unlikely, but possible, right? Big difference there. Our brain normally makes very unlikely become impossible. And that's where we get in trouble. That's where we have accidents happen. Because we're like, ah, oh, nuclear plant's going to be full oh, shit. <laughs> it's just unlikely. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, okay. Anything else from homework? Yes. Four four. 
That was a rough section. All right, let's see. I love it. All right, this is a good problem because this is this uh there's a mistake you can make on this problem that I would be completely fine with because it's definitely something we don't think about. So let me let me see how this goes. This sounds very um you know, a lot of what we do in probability is very much related to uh, courtroom proceedings, finding enough evidence for something. DNA match. Is it 100%? No. 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 But it's so damn close that it is admissible as evidence, right? Okay, cool. Um, let me see, blah, blah, blah. So this one says, this is number 24 on page 169. This one says that they get nine crime victims listen to voice recordings of five different men. So I have nine uh, crime victims. And they have, they listen to, uh, what was it? I already forgot. Five different voice recordings. Five different men. All nine victims identified the same voice as that of the criminal. Now right there, by itself, without even knowing too much about the probabilities involved, just by itself, if you had nine people all identify the same voice, and they're not all in the same room at the same time, what do you think? Uh, sure. Yeah, he said yeah, he thinks so. Yeah. No, they're all separate. You with me? One person comes in, they listen, they say that's the guy, this one. And then the next one comes in, listen to all the five voices, and they say that's the one. If they all pick the same guy, what do you think? What do you think about the guy? He did it, right? Even though it's still somewhat likely that not likely, it's somewhat possible that they all happen to pick by random chance. You kind of with me? Sort of with me? Pretend like you are. All right. Um, but what we want to do is we want to, what we're going to try to do in this class is show how you can impose a little order in there. You can kind of set up uh, what's enough evidence, what's not enough evidence, especially when we get into Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the biggie. Chapter 8 is where we actually go collect evidence. We see if it was enough evidence. We, we talk about, well, what's enough evidence, all that kind of stuff. But here, this is going to be insanely good evidence. And, and what do you think really good evidence is? Like, um, oh, if somebody said, uh, no, our, our machines, our, um, our uh, pricing machines are fine. They don't overcharge anybody. And I go randomly pick 50 of them, and 49 of them overcharge me on something. Right? That's pretty good evidence that, that those machines don't work correctly. Right? But if three of them give me the wrong price, I don't know. I just randomly selected. Maybe I happen to randomly select good ones for the most part. <coughs> um, okay. So we have nine people. And they all pick the same person. So what's the probability that they do that? All nine pe people have to pick the same person. So first off, what's the probability that somebody picks a specific person? Okay, I start to hear that murmur through. I like it. One out of five chance, right? There's five people. The probability that you pick a specific person is one-fifth. So the mistake here, if I've got nine people picking, and the probability that somebody picks the same person is one-fifth, you might think, how would you get this answer? What would my, my hangman game would be nine things long? Don't make me write all that crap out. What's the shortcut? They each would be a one-fifth probability. How many of them are there? That's the mistake I can live with. There is a mistake there. I desperately want you guys to understand. It's not a huge mistake. It's an understandable mistake, but it's important. I don't know if you guys are really with me on this. It's, this is exactly like picking five people who are left-handed. It'd be 0.11 to the fifth power, like we talked about before. Or oh, the first one and the second one and the third one. And what's and mean? What's the word and mean in probability? Multiply. 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 I like it. Basically multiply, right? Maybe a little adjustment. Okay, so what I'm doing is the first guy picks somebody, the second guy picks somebody, the third guy picks somebody, and they're all going to be that same thing. Since they're each separate, one at a time, one at a time, will the first guy picking somebody affect the next dude? 
No, they don't see each other doing that thing. You don't want them to influence each other if you're the cops, right? But can anybody tell me what the mistake that was made here? The key words are the probability of picking a specific person is one out of five. What mistake has been made here? It might be easier. Oh, let's see. So there's nine people. They're all picking somebody. Well, nine people are picking, so it's not one out of five because it's nine times over. No, each time, each time, what am I doing? The first person picks somebody specific would be a one out of five shot. That won't change just because I have nine people doing it, right? The probability somebody's left-handed is 11%. So what's the probability now if I pick 80 people? It's still freaking 11%. But that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Thank God, no. Here's the mistake, and this is I just wanted to throw that out to see if anybody sees it. It's not easy to see. They, somebody has to start things off. Somebody has to pick somebody. And of course, it's going to be the first guy. So what's the chance that the first guy picks a person? What's the probability he picks a person? Just pick somebody, anybody. What's he going to go into that room to do? He's going to go in there and listen to people, and he's going to do what? He's going to pick somebody. So what's probably he's going to pick somebody? 100%. One. He gets the ball rolling. He picks somebody. What's probably he picks the person that he picks? 100 freaking percent? That's almost stupid, right? What's probably he picks the guy that he picked? 100%. And then this guy's got to agree with him, and then this guy's got to agree with both of them. This guy got to agree. But the each now, this is a one-fifth chance that the second guy picks the first guy's guy, right? That was a very strange sentence. So one out of five chance that the second guy picks the guy that this guy picked. Right? Still not good with all those guys in there, but you bet. Buddy, fella, guy. One, one fifth chance that he picks that same person. One fifth. So it's that weird, somebody's got to get the ball rolling. So it's not one fifth to the ninth. It's one fifth to the eighth. Eight people have to agree with the person that the first person picked. What is one fifth to the eight power? Somebody help me out. It's gonna be like stupid small. Your calculator might start to smoke. Sure, go ahead. Two point five six. To the be negative, careful. To the negative six. All right. Two point five six. Negative six. So that'll be one, two, three, four, five. So I really want you to realize. I mean, this is exactly what we kind of in our brain somewhere know to be true. If nine people all pick the same guy, we're like, it's got to be the guy. You with me? Unless all nine people hate this one guy, like, let's all pick that guy. I know he's in the line. Yeah. Which is not impossible. But there's this probability that if I convict that guy based mainly on the nine people picking him, the chance that I'm wrong, the chance that I sent an innocent man to jail is this chance. Which is not... A reasonable doubt. That's the key words, right? Within a reasonable doubt. This is not a reasonable doubt. This is this is almost zero, basically, for any normal human being. You with me? But there's always that chance we're wrong. And math can't. I love that's why I love statistics. Math can't make you certain about who killed somebody. You can't do math and go, oh, yeah, it was him. That's what probably saying, dude. There's still a chance you picked the wrong guy. Well, you do whatever you want to. I'm just statistics. I don't have to do that shit. So there have to be at least one person that chose correctly, and it has to have eight people has to has so there has to be at least one that. Yeah, because really the statements that go for each of these people is what's the probability that he picks the same guy? What's the probability that he picks the same guy? As who? As the first person to go right. So he's got to pick somebody. So what's his statement? What's the probability that he picks somebody? 100% chance. So if you did that problem and you put one-fifth to the ninth power, that right there kicks a lot of ass. I could live with that mistake because it's a very weird little mistake. Most problems don't have this in them. Okay, so if I don't hear that question when I ask for homework questions, I get worried that homework is being done at all because that is a weird question. I expect that question. Yeah? Can you do on um, 27 part C? 
27 is the other one. Anybody do this? Any, any other people out there? Uh, like when I go on a conference, I think I already told you this, that I have the alarm clock and my phone both set to go off because I'm like, I can't miss, I don't want to be late. And then my vice president's like, uh, we're paying for you to be here. Uh, where the hell were you? Oh, shit. So I set a couple of alarm clocks. Why do I do that? Fails, yeah, I got a redundancy. That's the idea of the O-rings, right? Several O-rings in a row. That's how I kind of introduced the idea of and being multiplication. You build in redundancy. If one alarm clock fails, the other one's got your back. The probability, now what that really means in terms of probability? The probability that both alarm clocks fail will be less than the probability that, well, let's work it out. I don't know. I'm not so good with language. <laughs> so this is another question, of the alarm clock question. Um, to me, if my alarm clock has a 90% chance of working, I'm buying a new alarm clock because that's really damn bad. One out of every 10 days is not going to wake you up. It's like, I can't. That's not good. But we'll go with it. Probably it works is 90%. So now notice, this is a huge suggestion. When you're doing probability problems, you want to take the numbers they're telling you and assign them symbols. The probability it works is 0.90. So it's probably it doesn't work. 0.1. That's crazy. Okay. All right? Good. So I get two alarm clocks. Well, let's see what they ask here. They say, what's the probability that your one alarm clock will not work on the morning of an important final exam? Right? And I love that phone call. Maybe my alarm clock didn't wake me up. If I get like seven of those calls, I'm like, no, somebody, at least one person's lying. <laughs> Screw this. Um, so what's probably, part A says, what's, we already answered that. Probably it won't work. It's 10% chance. If you have two such alarm clocks, what's the probability that they both fail? So I get two clocks. It's probably that they both fail, so not work, not work. Is it cool if I say it like that? What word that's very important to probability is hidden here? And. and. The first one does not work, and. and the second one does not work. So I know I'm going to use multiplication, a kick ass. I love it. See how you break these things down. So it's probably the first one does not work. 0. 0.10. I have no idea why you went to the same store and bought the same crappy ass alarm clock that one out of every 10 days doesn't work, but okay, whatever, right? It was, it's free, then I can, then I can live with that. Um, in that case, I just buy 20 of them, because um, they're free. And then what, and the second one does not work, point one up. Now, why do I not have to worry about that second probability changing, like you guys did earlier with the uh, people line, it was 51 out of 98, and then he made it 50 out of 97. Why do I not care about the other one? Uh, they're two separate alarm clocks. This alarm clock won't look over and go, well, he's not working. I'm not going to work shit. They're independent of each other, right? Unless, of course, they are plugged in, and then they both depend on the power in your house, right? So hopefully, let's just say we have batteries, brand new batteries in both, right? That we bought at different stores. <laughs> they're completely independent. So that's why I can just multiply them together. I don't have to do the probability this one works given that this one didn't work. Or something like that. You guys kind of with me? The only time you can just directly multiply probabilities is if you know for sure that they are independent or your sample is so small like we talked about earlier or last time. It's less than 5% of your population. Then you can assume it's independent. So, of course, what do you get there? One on one. It's crazy. So still, one out of every 100 days, their both alarm clocks will not work. Which ain't bad, right? Hell, this is the built-in break for you, right? You wake up, like, oh, today was a break. All right. Um, what's the probability of being awakened if you use two alarm clocks? This is the one that everybody messes up on. And I can't remember what your specific question was on, whoever asked this question. So there you go. All right. This is the one that everybody messes up on. The probability that I am, I love 
awakened. I have been awakened. Now, can you translate that into some statement sounding more like they will both fail? One will fail. One will work and one will fail. I mean, can you translate it into that kind of a statement? What is it? What will wake me up? Working an alarm will wake you up. I like that. Working alarm, working alarm clock. Good. So, do I figure out this? What's wrong if I figure that out? It'll still wake me up, hopefully, if, if just one works. Do I need both? Do I have them, like, taped to my head? And if only one goes off, I'm like, nah. I need both to go? Yeah. We'd be able to do uh, the opposite. Uh, Kicking ass in. All right, good. That was, that was <laughs> my version of German. Um, the probability I'll wake up is the probability that, now, now I'd love it if somebody come up with a phrase that's a little more mathematical, but still English. At least one works. The probability that at least one works. What's the opposite of at least one works? I almost can hear you. Or both. So at the probability of at least one works is not that one doesn't work. Because at least one works includes the fact that maybe one of them doesn't work, right? So what's the opposite of at least one works? None work. So how do opposite probabilities relate? Opposite probabilities. One will be one minus the other one. And we know that. There's a 0.2 chance of rain today. What's the chance that it won't rain? 0.8, Jeff, because that's how opposite probabilities relate. So the probability at least one anything really is one minus the probability of none. Which in this case is one minus probability that the first one fails and the second one fails. And the beautiful thing about that question right there is we already did it. Yeah, 0.99. Now, out of curiosity, what's probably work, work? That would be 0.9 times 0.9. And that, of course, is... What's 9 times 9? Yeah, 81, right? So 0.81. So if you give me that answer on this question, I'd have to ask, why the hell did you go buy that other clock? If it's actually less of a chance you'll wake up than if you have one clock, how the hell did that work? They both go off and they cancel each other out. Their sound waves cancel each other out perfectly. No, you don't. Physics joke. Okay. Physics <laughs> jokes normally fall flat. Um, anyway, so that's part C. That's how you do anything related to at least one something. That's one minus none. That's the only thing that's left out. That will actually make a little more sense after we look at chapter 5 a little bit today. Okay, cool. Anything else? Any other questions? Let me give you this answer key to that practice quiz. And then I'll see if there's any questions on the practice quiz.
Yes, sir. Uh, you could, but you don't really need to, especially because, well, I know on number two this is true also, but they're both uh, not equally likely. You all right? All right. That was a reaction to something, I just don't know what. <laughs> Now we've already gone through one like practice test and one practice test answer key, and the la the worst thing you can do is to sit there and agree with me. That didn't do anything for you. It gives you a false sense of confidence. Oh yeah, I would have done that. So hopefully some of you guys actually tried the practice quiz out. So you can kind of check it out. If you haven't done the practice quiz yet, don't even look at that thing. Don't look at it. Stop. If you haven't done the practice quiz. Reality, you can do whatever you want to, but that's my suggestion. So you guys have any questions from that practice quiz? Yes, sir. Yeah. How big is the population on that first problem? Uh, American. American. Americans, right? And that's... 300 something, 320 million maybe somewhere, I don't know. You guys with me? So why did I just say that? What does that have to do with this problem at all? I like that. It doesn't have a damn thing. No, it has something to do with it. That explains why I'm allowed to do what I did. Did I, was I very careful about, well then I get the next guy, so I gotta change the numbers, and then I gotta change the numbers for the next one? Did I do any of that? No. So what the hell? Yeah, how many people am I picking? How many Americans? Three. Three. Three Americans. Out of 320 million. So that is definitely less than 5%. So I can treat, treat each person as being independent from each other. Right? So I have, uh, for any questions I ask, I have these three positions representing each person. I'm going to fill them in with the probabilities of whatever situation I want them to be in. So in this case, I want the first two people to not like the plan. So what's the chance that somebody does not like the plan? Yeah, 26%, right? So 0 0.26, 0 0.26. But I want the last person to like it. Yeah, it's got to be the rest. 74%, yeah. Yeah. How would you do it in a whole number? So how do you mean? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, you can do that. Just be careful because I always get somebody that does like 26 out of 100 times 25 out of 99. And why does that not make any sense? We, we looked at one like that the other time. This is assuming what? Yeah, but that's basically what this really is. I'm picking three different people. So I'm not putting the first one back in. But what's wrong with this then? This assumes that there is 100 people in America. That's, that's kind of scary. What the hell happened? Yeah. Can number one also be like with replacement? Question can, like this can be with replacement? It could be, but the way I've worded it, it actually isn't. Because when I said pick three Americans, I am saying that they have to be three different people. Okay. If I put somebody back in, there's a chance I could pick the same person. Now, what's the chance of that in 320 million people? Not a very good chance, unless I'm just, you know, as far as my arm. From America, I pick you. Yay. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not good. That's obviously convenience. Um, so this last guy, like you said, will be 0.74. You multiply that all out, you get a nice decimal that represents probability. It's almost too easy the math to really stand back and, and really understand what we just did. But this would represent the probability that the third person likes it and the other two don't. So why would I want to know that? Chapter 5, we'll talk a little bit more about how this kind of thing helps us. Right now, I just want nuts and bolts. Can you do this kind of work? Um, part B is the same way. just want all three of them to not like it. So dislike, dislike, dislike. And then part C is a question you know I'm going to have. What's probably at least one likes it, 
would be one minus the probability that none of them like it. And none of them like it is a question I asked you on part B. So you just got to do one minus whatever the hell you got in part B. So somewhere on that quiz, that's going to happen. So what if I said, what if I was evil? I said probably at least two. And I like picked, picked 80 people or whatever. Probably at least two people. Well, what does at least two leave out? If I say at least two people have to like it, that's two or three or four or five. Who did, how many did I leave out as chances? One. One? And none. So this would be 1 minus probably none minus probability of 1. So probability of at least 1 is 1 minus the opposite of at least 1. And then what's another way to think of opposite is everything this leaves out. That's the opposite. This leaves out 0. That's the only number it leaves out. You can't have negative people like something. All right, that'd be freaky. Negative person. Touch them and you just disappear. Anti-person. This would be minus probably a nobody. So, I mean, the idea is extendable, but this is the one that happens most often in the real world. So that's the one we kind of focus on. Okay. Any other questions on that practice quiz? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, good, good, good. So what does it mean to be independent? If A and B are independent... What must be true? I love it. Now, what mathematical statement captures that? Something I can actually test. A test for independence. Right. Now, I can't get Will Smith out of my head. Independence day runner. A and B are independent. What? So A does not affect B. B does not affect A. So if I looked at this, what should happen? This, what does this say? A. Probability A, Four. given B. And, and like you just said, they don't, they're not supposed to affect each other. So if B happens, what should happen to the probability of A? Nothing. Nothing. So it should still be the probability of A. If this is true, then the two things are independent. And that's, that's what this statement means. B happened. Did A give a shit? No. D you with me? Okay. So, look at, look at number four. Being male and owning a Toyota. So, if I ask you, being male and owning a Toyota, are they independent? You look, you compare something like this. Now, did I ask you about probably male in this question? On uh, number three? Yeah. Yes, that's part A. So I have that from 3A. And then I asked you about probably male given Toyota. Yes, 3D. So if these two numbers are the same, if they are the same, what does that mean? These two things are independent because if, if if I get, if I tell you that they're a Toyota owner and that probably they're a man does not change they're independent they didn't affect each other does that make sense on some level just in English does that make sense that's what independent should mean right if I'm independent from you and you're over there jumping up and down I don't care the hell you do whatever the hell you want to right if I depend on you for sustenance and I'm worried that you've gone insane, I, I depend on you. I'm gonna, it's going to affect me. Um, so you just have to do these two. Now, if these are different, then, of course, they are dependent. Yes, because that would change. If the probability changes between these two, then it must be dependent. That means that one does depend on the other one. Okay, maybe, maybe. That's really all there is to it. I always, you cannot answer that kind of question with a paragraph of words. You can answer this question only with math, right? 
I said that, and I'm still going to get somebody to write me a little paragraph explaining, no, oh, you could be a man and own a Toyota, and they're not. Or, no, that's all crap. That, that doesn't answer anything. This is the answer. This is what you have to look at. And I will pretty much always get you to do that work already. You just have to go pick it out. Okay. All right, so anything else from that practice quiz before we get into some new stuff? Okay, so chapter four, uh, it's really just the nuts and bolts because now we're going to get into some stuff. I'm going to refer back every now and again to like the, one of the main things you really want to understand from chapter four is and means multiply. And I think I've said that enough to where everybody's like, if you say it one more time, I'm going to probably throw up. So I'm not going to say that one more time, just in case it's true for anybody. Um, so here's what I want us to look at. And this actually has a lot to do with, for example, how I calculate the average, your average at the end of the semester. You've had, what kind of classes have you had where they tell you on the syllabus how they're going to calculate averages? You have my kind of class, which how do I do it? What, what do I set up there as far as grades? Yeah, percentages, right? The final is like 20 or 25%. I have the weird or thing in there, but we talked about that before. What other kind of class do you have? A class where like the midterm is 500 points, right? The points classes, those are normally the, the, the classes where the people are either not very good at math or something. Math people use that and I don't understand. I'm like, you're good at math, hopefully. Um, the, but the points thing is, uh, you'll never see me do that, but uh, So how do you calculate an average? Let's make a, a simple example. Uh, let's say that homework, I just got this. <laughs> homework is 10%. Uh, uh, we have uh, midterm, that's uh, 40%. And then a final, that's 50%. You want to take that class? Okay, me either. Of course, I had a class where the whole grade was the oral final. Put us each in a different room, gave us a question, and then left for a little while. It didn't say when it was going to be back. Anyway, that was exciting. Somebody had a nervous breakdown in the room next to me. That was, that was great. <laughs> I was sort of, my probability of passing changed a lot when I heard them breaking down. Uh, so if you make, like, uh, on the homework, you get a 90... On the midterm, you get a 72, but on the final, you just did pretty good and get an 88. Which grade means the most in this setup? The final, right? It's the highest grade. But actually, these two together mean just as much as that by itself. You with me? So, but how do I, do I just add the three grades up? and divide by three, that really wouldn't make sense based on what you just told me. The most important grade up here is the final. You with me so far? Okay, so let me do one uh, mathematical uh, example of how this is going to work, and then we'll come back and attack this. And some of you guys probably already know how to do this. Hopefully, you know how to do this. It would really help you when you're taking this kind of class. Um, if I wanted to find the average of these numbers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, I like it. So what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks is we're going to hit a situation where data is given to us in a different format. So we could always just Take it in the new format and put it into a big list. Because I just like I just did. There's a big list of data. I know how to find the average. I know how to find the standard deviation. I know all that stuff. Right? But what's a little bit better is to make a new formula based on that new format for the mean and for the standard deviation. Then I can just use the new formula. I don't have to mess with it. And what if my list would be thousands long? I don't want to do that. Screw that. This is a nice list. How would I find the average? Add them up, I love it. And I could be smart about how I add them up, right? I could say there's uh, two ones plus three twos plus one three 
plus four fours. Is that cool? That, I'm not doing, no, of course you're all, this is, it sounds too much like a stupid card trick. What if I put the card here? I'm not doing anything. No. Uh, uh, this is nothing, I mean, that's just how you would add them up, hopefully, right? That's a quick way to add them up. Is that cool? Okay. <laughs> Over explain. And then I'm going to divide it by 10, because it's freaking 10 numbers, right? That doesn't change. So divide by 10. Now, now you can do that, and let me just put over here in big brackets. If you just do that, what do you get? Somebody help me out. 2.7. 11, 27, yeah, 2.7. Okay, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go further steps. So I can figure out what to do when I'm just given percentages. Because notice, couldn't I rewrite this like this, especially because I'm a freaky math dude? Couldn't I write this as 2 tenths times 1 plus 3 tenths times 2? 1 tenth times 3, 4 tenths times 4. Yeah. Good. And then what's uh, two tenths? Isn't that 0.2 or 20 percent? And this is 0.3 or 30 percent, so forth. So if I do 0.2 times 1 plus 0.3 times 2 plus 0.1 times 3 plus 0.4 times 4, not surprisingly, if I do that, I'm going to still get 2.7. It's the same stupid numbers, right? But now you see, for example, what's the most important number up there? What's Four. the heaviest weighted number? Four. Because it makes up 40% of the average of all your grades. It makes up 40% of all your grades. So we, now we can see how to do it if it's given to me already in average, in percentages. How would you get your average grade? You take 10% of 90 plus... 40% of 72 plus 50% of 88. Just make that more mathematical. 0.1 times 90 plus 0.4 times 72 plus 0.5 times 88. Anybody already know how to do that? Hopefully a few of you guys maybe. Nobody? A few of you guys? Okay. That's the mathematical reason why that makes sense. Just multiply by the weights. Because it ends up weighting that thing more than the other things, if it's heavier weighted. Uh, somebody tell me, what do you get when you do that? 81.8. 81.8, cool. Which is a B minus, and you can argue with the teacher about that. It's really close, man. Okay, maybe. Okay, not too bad. So that's the first part of section uh, 5.2 is this kind of thing. So let me show you what this is really going to look like in full form here. So, so real quick, I want to point something out before you get too far. Couldn't I write a list like I did over there? 10% would have to be 90, 40% would have to be 72, and 50% would have to be 88. So I could do 190, four 72s, and then 588s. I think you can get the idea. And then just take the average like I normally would you with me. I could just take this information in this other format and then put it as a list. Do you guys see that? Sort of the opposite of what we did with what I just erased over there. But would you want to do that if, for example, I had this? Probably not from your tone, Jeff. I go out and I ask people how many pets they own, and I get these numbers here. Oh, and now I got to keep track of how many. Okay, I could do this. Uh, is that right? 34, 50, 50, yes. So you help me out. 34, yes. Okay. What am I being careful about? Make it, make it sure it makes 100%. If it's not 100%, what must, what, is it okay? No. Hell no. So it's not, it's not a valid probability distribution if probability of x, uh oh, I'm going to use, uh, cool. If the sum, of the probabilities don't equal one, then something's wrong. 
or at least close if you round it, right? So you always see that. Don't you see that when they have pie charts and they say percentages might not add to one due to rounding? And then you're like, okay, whatever, that's fine. <laughs> right? So if I round it somewhere, maybe they're not going to come out exactly one, but they better come out to 0.99 or something, 1.01. 1 .01. It better not be far away from one or else something's wrong. All right, so let's see if you can handle this. Now, now, would I want to make a list like this to do this problem? How many zeros would there have to be? Let's see if anybody gets this. Why did I put 190? Because there's 10%. 10%. And how long is my list going to be? 10. 10 numbers. It's 1 out of 10, 4 out of 10, 5 out of 10. You with me? What would this be? 11 out of? So how long is my list going to be? 100 numbers. You want to do that? No. no. I'll let you do it if you want to, and then I'll just do this to you, and then you have to have a thousand. You just have to be a thousand long. And then I get some jacket and it does it, and I'm like, wow. Way to prove a point by taking up your afternoon doing that. But how do I figure this out? Because this is the format we're going to work with. I know what to do. You take the weight times the value plus the weight times the value. So really that means I multiply across, add down. Right? Weight times value. So that'll be x times p of x in symbols. Is that cool? That's exactly what we did here. 10% times 90. So that was x times p of x. Cool. So then what'd you get? Zero. Zero. 0.39. 0.32. 32. 0.6. 0.6. 0.56. 0.56. I like it. And if I add them up, what do I get? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Close. So one point yeah. And what does that number represent? What is that? The average number of pets. Good. That's the average number of pets. I love it. That's the average for this data set, and this data set was number of pets people have. So this would be the average. We'll see why in a minute why I have to call it mu and not x bar. I actually have to do that. How it feel so far? Do you guys see if I give you a long ass list? Can you guys start looking at this like this would be L1? This would be L2? This would be? I like it. It is L3, but what would you define it as? L1, L1 times L2. Right? If I give you a long ass list, you really don't want to do it piece by piece, so you just have the calculator munch it up. Right? How are we doing so far? Okay, about the same as always. You all are on some kind of neat medication that just <laughs> the whole day is like even. <laughs> I love it. It's freaking me out a little bit. Um, all right, so now we know how to find the average if they give it to us like this, and what I call the XP of X format. Uh, what is the formula then, really? Mu equals, how did you get that number? What did you do? X times X. Add it up. These. So how does that look as a formula? Let's add it up. Sigma. Sum, the sigma. I like it. Add it up. X P of X. X P of X. So that's the formula for the mean when it's in this format. Kick ass. Now the funny thing is, what's the formula for the mean for just a list of numbers? Sum of x divided by how do you find the average? You sum up the numbers and you divide by the number, the, number, the end, right? What's on the bottom of a probability? Like if I said, probably you're going to pick a king out of a deck of cards. What's on the bottom? 52, the total, the end, the number. So this is still x over n because this has an over n in it. You with me? A little bit. Formulas can't change so much that you can't find the old formula in them. They've just been adjusted somehow. This is an adjustment that was made. You can still find the old formula in there. All right, the one that's going to be a little bit harder is, of course, this is always going to be a little harder. And I'll tell you this, I have a handout 
that will augment your notes with this. It has like a worked out example all the way with the mean and standard deviation and stuff. Okay, so just hang on for that. Uh, but I want to first talk about standard deviation. How, how do I find standard deviation? You remember the old days when I made you do this, which I'll never make you do again? Unless you didn't do it in your homework in the first place, which some of you guys got back today, or will get back. And you have to do it. <laughs> I'm going to make you redo it. Um, I would do this, right? So I look vaguely familiar. And I would do what with these? Add them up. Add them up. And then I would, to get this, to, uh, let me change this to mu, Take just so I can have it nice and by population. I would sum these up, divided by n for this case, because it's a uh, population. Is that cool? Sample is when it's n minus 1 on the bottom. So the difference that we're going to do is notice how I don't find the average by just adding these up. I have to multiply by the weights. So I desperately want you with me on this. So now, in order to find the average, this is the old way. I mean, the standard deviation. The new way is going to be, let me put my x's down here again. I still have to find x minus x bar squared, or mu. So what do we figure? We figured the average is 1.87. Right? The average is 1.87. So what is... Uh, so I could do this pretty quickly. It's negative 1.87 squared. Somebody help me out. Is that cool, right? Zero minus the mean squared. Is that cool? You guys just don't give anything away. I love it. Don't tell them. Okay. One minus 1.87 is negative 0.87. So what do you get? 1.87 squared? 3.5. 3.5? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Negative 0.87 squared? Point seven. 7. 0.7. 6. 0.7. 6. roughly. Mm -hmm. And then this would be 2 minus 1.87 is 0.13 squared. It's 0.169, right? 3 minus 1.87 will be 1.13 squared, which is something. 1.26. 1. 1.42. 1.3. 1. 1.3? I was close. I'll live with that. 0.13. And then 4 minus 1.87 would be 2.13. Oh, point zero? Yeah. I forgot. Thank you. That was one order of magnitude too big. And then 4.5? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's like what we had to do back in Chapter 3. Now, I can't just add these up and throw it into this formula. For the same reason, I can't just find the average of these by adding them up and dividing by 5. I have to first multiply by the weight. So I would take, I don't know why I do all that crap. I'm going to find a shortcut here in a minute. I would multiply all of these deviations squared times the weight. And then I would add them up and go from there. You guys kind of with me. So in this format, if I add this, I can figure all these, take these numbers times the probability. I left off probability, but there's the probabilities, right? Take that number of 3.5 times 0.11, and then it's 0.76 times 0.39, so forth. You guys semi with me? And then the standard deviation would be the sum of the of the what I just did. The sum of the weights times those deviations. And what's kind of missing from the old formula that we know isn't really missing? Where's the over n? It's like ragu, right? It's in there. It's in the probability. Over n. The joke is getting really old now. So I'll tell you what, let, before I get uh, too much on the board there, let me show you what it looks like in the calculator. There's two calculators left up here if you want to borrow one, because you're going to do your own problem here in a minute. Okay, good. 
see where can I put this. Let me put it up here. So this is the old stuff, the old way. I'm going to take that away. As long as you actually did it in your homework for section 3.3, you'll never have to do it again for me. Um, while the computer is warming up, I'm just going to write this down. We're going to focus... I'm going to show you three different ways to do this problem, just because to make you feel like, oh my God, why? Uh, we're gonna. There's one way. It's going to be purely calculator. Just let the calculator spit it out at me, and that's the way. Of course, that is a great way to check your work. It's not a good way to get your answer. Um, the second way is going to be this way. I want to show you what this whole table looks like in the calculator. That's the way I would do this problem. Because uh, as you can tell, doing it piece by piece is just really annoying. This is 1970s technology. Shouldn't it be a little bit faster? All right. Um, while that is deciding whether or not it's going to wake up, I do want to do one little thing. Uh, don't freak out. We're not going to do this all the way out. But here's a little bit of the reason why you have algebra to do this class. Uh, what would you do with that piece in an algebra class most likely? It's coming. Well, you mean sort of the opposite of that. Multiply it out, right? Factoring is already factored. You'd foil it out. So if you foil that out, wouldn't that be x squared minus 2 mu x? Is that cool so far? Plus mu squared. Does that sound familiar at all? Yes. Okay. Or at least, you know, does the form look familiar? Mu squared does not sound familiar at all. All right, I'm going to do something with that here in a second. Okay. So if you have your calculator, so let's do this together. Go to your lists. I'm going to clear out my first three lists here. Careful, don't hit delete when you go to clear a list out. You've got to hit clear, or else your delete your list will just go away. That won't be good. So hopefully, get to a point where you have all this. Now let's put the data in. And then the probabilities, that's part of the data. You don't need all that, Jeff. No. Okay, cool. What do we want L3 to be? L1 times L2. Yeah, let's kind of do this again and make sure we get the same numbers. I could do L1 times L2. So L3 would equal 1 L1 times L2. Cool? Mm -hmm. So far so good. And then you hit the over button, you can go over to list four, clear it out if there's stuff in there. And then how would I recapture what we did here? Yeah, what is this? Where are my X's? Let's translate this. X's are in which list? L1. L1. The mean. L3. Careful. The so mean is not in L3. The mean is 1.87. It's a number, right? So L1 minus 1.87 squared. So if I say that for this, if I say L4 is L1, parentheses, L1, 
minus 1.87 squared. I get the 3.5, the 0 0.76, all the numbers we got earlier, right? Okay, cool. And then what am I missing? How do I get this one? Where are these at? Yeah, so what we just did. So it's an L4. That'll be L4 times, where are these? L2. L2, I love it. L4 times L2 will give me this. So if I go over to L5, good lord. This only has six lists, really. Find the last one. Right? So if I make L5 equal to L4 minus L2, Oops, what did I do? I wish I could say I did it on purpose, but oh well. What, why did I get an error when I did that? I like it. I'm trying to put an entire list in that first piece, and I can't do that. It's not big enough. So i got to go delete that, go up to L5, stop doing that. Delete that, go up to L5, and now I can put in there L4 minus L2. I'm doing L four times L. Cool. Okay, so that's the part I was missing for the formula here. So how do I get the? So is everybody somebody with me? I heard furious tapping earlier, so hopefully that means everybody was staying with me. Um, we've gotten to this point now. Stand, the variance is the sum of this. So now I just need to sum those numbers up. And did I show you the quick way to do that? So I want to sum these numbers up, and that's going to be the variance. That's what the formula there says. So here's a quick way to sum that up. Hit second mode, hit quit to get out of your list. And then go to second stat where it says list on top. If you go over to math, let me do that again. Make sure everybody's with me. It's second stack to get into list. If you go over to math, one of the things you can do with the lists is number five, sum. So I want to sum up which list. So I hit five for sum, and I want to sum up these guys. These guys are in L5. So sum up L5. And that's my variance. You, you suck. So this is uh, 1.5731. Now, I'm not going to do the next step yet. What would I do next? Why is that not a good place to stop? Yeah, I want to take a square root so I really get the standard deviation. This is the variance. This is like square people, which is just freaky. Okay. In this case, it gets to be square pets, which is definitely strange. Um, so I want to show you the shortcut, and I want to make sure that it comes out to the same number so we can kind of believe it, that it's actually true. And the reason i got to kind of get you to believe it a little bit is we're not going to do this all the way out because it gets kind of disgusting. This is not summation algebra class. So I, I at least want you to see where the first couple pieces come from. If I multiply this in, distribute the P of X, isn't the first thing I get this? Right? It's not very amazing. And the rest of it, believe it or not, the rest of it comes out to be minus mu squared. Now, I know, I, I, I completely understand that a lot of you guys look at these formulas and it's just bleh. Right? I understand that. Um, I'm hoping to God this is not that bad because it's small. And it's relatively easy to see the idea. This one is actually a nice formula, but working it out took five freaking lists. There's got to be a quicker way to do it. Please do God. So I don't want five lists. This is nice. Why is this nice? Because I can see the idea. Every standard deviation idea has to have this somewhere in it. Standard deviation is a measure of how far my, my data points are from the mean. So they have to have somewhere in them the difference between the data points and the mean. So I can see the idea here. This is what I call a conceptual formula. This is a calculation formula. 
This is easier to use, believe it or not. And this is why. Normally when I set up a problem, I'll have x, p of x, and then I have to do x, p of x to get the mean, right? So what we did earlier. This formula only needs one more column for me. If I already have x, p of x, what does this formula need? x squared p of x. Now what's wrong if I just square L3? Is that good? No, because then I'll get x squared p squared, which is not right. I need just x squared times p. So how many more x's do I need? One more x, don't I? So if I multiply these, if I multiply L1 times L3, I'll get x squared p of x. And then I just throw it into the formula. And I'm there. So let's verify that we get the same number we got for the variance right there. Let's make sure that we get the same one. So if I go back into my list, and I cut it down just a little bit, go to L4. I don't need all five lists now. Go to L4, and I want to make it L3 times L1. So I get x squared P of x. And this is the thing in general about mathematics that students don't quite get. If you can write in mathematical form an idea, you can then simplify that, and the idea is still there. So I have this idea from earlier, right? There's the idea for the variance. And if I simplify it, now I didn't show you all the steps. If you want to see all the steps, you can come to the office, it's great. But I'm not going to waste time on summation algebra to show you how this all works out. But at least you can see the first piece of it there, that's cool. And somehow all the rest of this crap reduces to minus mu squared. Which is sort of like, what the hell has it to happen? But it does. So these formulas have to be the same. They both have the same idea. So if I make L4, L1 times L3, that looks a lot nicer, right? So L4 is now L1 times L3. It has these x squared p of x's. How do I get the variance? I add those up, and I subtract the mean squared. So if I add those up, and I just showed you how to add them up, it's second quit to get the hell out of there. The awesome thing is when you have something on the screen already, I don't have to go second stat and go all that kind of crap. I can just hit second enter and bring it back up. But what do I want to sum? Do I want the sum of L5? What do I want? Sum of L4. Right? So sum L4. That's 5.07. Got it. So this would be 5.07. And what was the mean? Believe it or not, this is that same set of data from way long time ago. So what's the mean? 1.87. And the big mistake people make is they forget to square this dude. Right? It's minus the square of the mean. So if I take 5.07 minus 1.87 squared, it's the same damn thing, 1.5731. Right? Of course it is. They're the same formula. So it should be the same. So let me, let me give this out. I think this might help out quite a bit. If you can see like a fully worked out problem, I'm hoping this will help out. That was a lot. So kind of keep track of. Yes. So three to five, and the six and the one. Basically summed up what I just said. Yeah. Actually, yeah. No did you get? I think most of us lost track.
Thank you. So I have a worked out example there for number one. It's fully worked out, showing you all the little steps you can take to do this. And this is the kind of thing I'll need to see on the on a test or a quiz. So everything filled in, but you can use the calculator to do the work. That's no problem, right? Um, and I have several questions. Some of them should sound very familiar, like part D. We did the same kind of thing before. So I want you guys to use this. Throw it off one up. Use that as a guide that worked out problem, and do the one in the back. Do number two on the back. This is actually one I, I made up, but it sounds like something I'd want to do. If you ask a six-year-old, when are you going to retire, they might say, oh, 13. That's way down the road, man. Be ready. Lay on the beach. So try that number two on the back, using that number one as a guide. And call me over if you need some help.